office where uh, I think you go there, they'll give you a treat from 11 to 1. So make sure to do that. Also, if you're uh, doing the food drive with the uh, mac and cheese, uh, last week they were able to get 175 boxes. So if you do decide to get a box and donate it, uh, they're accepting those at the front desk of the library. And next month it will be a new item. But next month they're also going to be having a canned food drive for the veterans. And that's uh, basically take those donations to the Veterans Center that's up on the second floor. All right, so today we're going to talk about the Progressive Era and World War II Texas. The period from 1900 to 1919. Now, basically, the progressives are what happens to the populist movement uh, after they lose the election of uh, 1896, where they're, they're kind of morphed and melded into the Democratic Party, where they try to use the government as an agency for change. Once again, we were found on uh, seeking freedom from government, and now these guys seek the government to uh, try to make society more free, or what they see as more free. And we're taking baby steps. Like in 1885, the Terrell State Hospital is established in Rusk as a place to treat the mentally ill. It used to be just done in like uh, local uh, Jails is where they would hold them, but now we have a state facility for it. Also, the University of Texas expands to include their medical branch. The trains physicians. For the people of Texas. Now, nationally, we are starting to make movements. Is that in high or is it a Roman numeral one? That's a Roman numeral one. Okay. And this is basically the beginning of that movement where everything's fresh and new. We're not going to make it into Wilson today where it really takes kind of a sour turn. So needless to say we're entering a new America where the city becomes the focus of progressive politics. And there's a huge uh, population growth in the cities that are still industrializing. Indeed, from 1901 to 1914, more than 13 million immigrants come to our shores. Why are they coming here? Well, the pull of industrial expansion and the promise of plenty. Indeed, one immigrant was told, we were told in America that the streets were paved with gold. When we got here, we found out that the streets weren't paved with gold. In fact, the streets weren't even paved, and we were expected to pave them. But all joking aside, their lives were tremendously better than from where they had come. Meanwhile, 
up. We got a new Texas. In 1900, our population was 3 million, 48,710. By 1910, we jumped up to 4 million, 663,228. We too are undergoing a rapid urbanization with the development of the railroads. Basically, the stations and stops become centers of commerce. An excellent example of this is a tale of two cities. Jefferson was an incredibly large city in Texas in the 1890s. Basically, they had a lot of commerce that was going on the Red River around East Texas. And uh, the railroad was going to be coming through. And the railroad said, how much land are you going to give us? And Jefferson was so smug because they were doing financially so well, they said, we're not going to give you anything. You're going to have to buy all your land from us. We're Jefferson. Meanwhile, there was another scrappy city on the banks of a muddy river that really couldn't travel out to the Gulf of Mexico, even though they tried numerous times. They lured the railroads there, giving them a great land right next to downtown, giving them loans. And does anybody know what the name of this second city was? Dallas. Meanwhile, have any of y'all been to Jefferson, Texas? Jefferson, Texas, uh, basically when they demolished what was called a great raft or kind of a dam, that was slowing down the current on the Red River uh, that allowed it to flow freely. Water levels dropped. It kind of lost that maritime commerce and because the railroads had abandoned it. It now is known as come to Jefferson and see what Texas was like in the 1890s. Our big industries here are lumber as well as the railroad. And even though we slowly are industrializing and um, moving to the cities, by the 1920s, Texas leads the country in crop value. But a huge push hits us in 1901, Spindle Top. In 1901 near Beaumont. Now before this, they've been uh, drilling oil in the USA. Most of it came from Pennsylvania or the Quaker state. The wells there, you had to drill, drill about 25 feet or um, about 75 feet deep and you would hit the oil field and you would pull out oil. Well, here in Texas, a guy noted that underneath great salt domes, there were always seemed to be oil. So he took a bet and he said, hey, he went to some investors and said, give me the money, I'm going to drill through the oil shell and, I mean, the salt shell, salt dome, and we should find oil underneath. So they said, okay, and they gave him, a, they were able to buy him like a thousand feet of pipe. And so he goes out there and he starts drilling down, and 
he gets down to the thousand feet and he hasn't cracked the salt down. So he goes back to his investors and he says, please, 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 give me the money. I know that we're about to crack the salt down. They said, well, look, we only got the money for 250 more feet. And so he said, okay. So, you know, last chance, Charlie, he was putting down the 250 feet and um, he drilled all the way down and he wasn't able to crack through the salt dome. So frustrated, he tells his men, hey, go ahead, start pulling up the pipe. And they go and they start pulling it up. And all of a sudden, a sharp crack, like a pistol shot is heard. The ground rumbles and oil just starts to pour forth uncontrollably. I mean, it took them six days to shut off that oil. And in those six days, as much oil was wasted as the entire state of Pennsylvania produced in a year. So have we found our money? Yeah, we found our money. And uh, basically Beaumont, because uh, it's so filthy, because everybody's drinking, uh, drilling oil wells wherever they can, because that's money just to be had. Uh, you used to have to have boards from Derrick to Derrick so you wouldn't ruin your shoes uh, with the oil. Uh, the city was kind of crazy, but you know it was that was Texas's next source of money. By the 1909, Texas ranked sixth in oil producing states. And again, as more and more uh, wells are dug, the more we take the lead. And like I told you, that was a tremendous help to the University of Texas that was given that waste scrap land out in. West Texas, that uh, Santa Rita number one was drilled on. Meanwhile, in the New America, the progressive movement is also wanting to humanize labor. You have a strong socialist presence present. from Eugene Debs. Eugene Debs was a guy who, when he was 15 years old, he had to leave home and start working on the railroads. And of course, on the railroads, he continued to try to industrialize labor. The name of his uh, workers' union was the IWW or International Workers of the World. And the AFL, or the American Federation of Labor, would use the danger of the IWW that really scared a lot of business leaders. It would use this fear to make headway, to say, hey, look, we're only asking for a living wage. Those guys. They want crazy things, like free health care. Oh, and Eugene Debs ran for president like four times. He was put in jail numerous times. And you have this progressive push in government where they view government as the agency of change. And basically you'd be able to reinvigorate democracy by giving more power to the people, opening up more agencies that allow them access to the communal spirit of government.
Now, how is this reinforced here in Texas? Well, it gets reinforced with a disaster. In 1900, a terrible hurricane hits Gal Galveston, wiping out the city, totally destroying it. And guys, this is a huge deal. There's going to be huge departments that need to coordinate and be put under work. So they uh, start a city commission government, also known as the Galveston Plan, where you have certain members elected that are under just a specific area. It could be uh, something like wastewater removal. It could be something like we have here in Dallas where they're responsible for a specific ward within the city. And the specificity kind of blurs the lines between the executive branch and the legislative branch. But it has some advantages. Like it gets uh, rid of a lot of the bribery and corruption that was going on with past city governments. And by 1910, this uh, form of government has uh, spread to like Dallas, Fort Worth, and Houston. That's when we started having council members represent us. And a rather weak mayor. Well, then we get a new vice president, Teddy Roosevelt. This is a guy who, when he was born in 1858, he was a sickly child. Basically, his dad would pat him back and forth across the room to loosen the phlegm. Then uh, he started um, a health exercise program to match his um, working out of his mind. I mean, working out his mind. And basically, he became very proactive. I mean, the guy, he marries this beautiful girl on his honeymoon. They go to Europe. First thing he does is climb the Matterhorn, which is the tallest mountain in Europe. He was the youngest member of the New York State Legislature at 23. Then on Valentine's Day, both his uh, wife and his mom are uh, die. His wife from childbirth, his mom from typhoid, I believe. Later on that afternoon, he kind of loses everything. Uh, but he slowly works his way up from being the chairman of the board of the New York Police uh, City of Policemen, um, yeah, Commissioner of Policemen to Assistant Secretary of the Navy. Uh, he is the leader of the Rough Riders in the Spanish-American War. And basically the Republican Party wants to use his popularity to try to vault McKinley to the presidency. And here you can see an opinion, an editorial cartoon about how popular McKinley is compared to Roosevelt. And a lot of, I mean, if you think Trump is crazy, 
Roosevelt is right. And by the way, guys, a lot of Republicans did not like Teddy Roosevelt because he was a reformer. And you couldn't really control him. Uh, indeed, one businessman, Mark Hanna, said, don't you realize there's but one heartbeat between the president and this madman? Um, and little did he realize that his words were going to become true because shortly into his presidency, um, McKinley is assassinated by Leon Colts, who was pretty much crazy. And Teddy becomes the president. And basically he felt it was the duty of the president to be the steward of the people and the public welfare. As president, he really went after trusts and monopolies using the Sherman Antitrust Act. Indeed, one of the first monopolies he broke up was the Northern Securities Company, which was three railroads that had merged, creating a near monopoly over the Pacific Northwest. And the court ordered the company to be broken up. During his second term, he really becomes known as a trust buster. He goes after meat, oil, and tobacco trusts. Indeed, there was an anthracite coal miner strike. where the workers were demanding a minimum wage of $8 a day. The mine refused. Because of this, up in the north, coal supplies began to dwindle. Now, anthracite coal, just so you guys know, that's kind of like the super premium gas. In other words, it burns the hottest, uh, with the least amount of pollution, and residue. And because there's this shortage of uh, coal, you have like offices that can only be, or hospitals that can only be open for certain hours. No heat in schools. Basically, the owners refuse to budge. So Teddy Roosevelt goes in and he warns the owners that if they don't go ahead and figure out this mess, that he's going to move the army in and the mines are going to be reopened. So he was standing up for the workers. During his second term, he does stuff like pass the Meat Inspection Act of 1906. He did this because he had read The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. And he remembered soldiers dying in the Spanish-American War due to eating tainted meat. So basically what it does is it um, set health standards. For the minimums that meat had to uh, be so it could be sold. 
Indeed, more people died in the Spanish-American War from food poisoning than they did from battle uh, fatalities. The Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906 banned dangerous dyes, chemicals, and filth that were contaminating foods. And the Hepburn Act uh, blocked unreasonable freight rates as determined by the Interstate Commerce Commission. So you can see that some of this is some of the stuff that the Grangers and the Farmers Alliance wanted. Especially like the Hepburn Act. And basically he handpicks his successor, which is Taft, who really wanted to be a Supreme Court Justice, but his wife told him, you be president. So he said, okay. And he ran for the president, he wins. He does even, he prosecutes even more uh, trust than Teddy Roosevelt did, more than 40, but he has no real panache for uh, PR. And like I said, Woodrow Wilson is a whole different story. Well, the thrust to change Texas. This is even a Dallas guy. George Clifton Edwards. <clears throat> he was born in uh, 1877. Went to uh, Dallas High School. Then he graduated from uh, the University of the South in Sawney, Tennessee. He entered grad studies at Harvard. And he returned to Dallas in 1899. By 1901, he starts teaching at Dallas High School, becomes really moved with the uh, social gospel movement. And so what he does is he moves his family to a factory section in South Dallas known as Cementville. And guys, the conditions there were horrid. He himself caught tuberculosis there. Uh, one of his children died because the environment, he had three kids, one of them died in Cementville because of the horrid conditions. But he went there basically to open up a night school to teach both the parents as well as the kids how to read. Well, due to health concerns, because as I told you, he came down with tuberculosis himself, he started printing The Laborer, which basically was a newspaper for the trade unions here. He began to fight for a law against child labor here in Texas. because he remembers kids younger than 12 working in the mills.
He ran for governor as a socialist, and he came in second. Ran for mayor, came in third. But he continued to be a very outspoken person for free speech throughout his life, even once being kidnapped by the KKK as he was fighting against them. He was he, well, he walked in front of his son, said, "Hey, I got to run over the street and get this." And then his uh, George Clifton Edwards said, "Okay, be, uh, I'll be here when you get back. When he comes back, his dad isn't there." And then basically he's brought back, a little beaten up uh, by about midnight by the Klan. But he continued to represent his clients. Anyway, we are able to get some of the basics of legal reform here in Texas. For example, in labor, they uh, ask for and they get 16-hour work days on the railroads. Imagine that working 60, working more than 16 hours. That backbreaking work. They make it illegal to blacklist employees. That's basically where you have a list of these are people that this shop, store, construction agency will not hire. Because they might be labor leaders, they might be socialists. They're icky people that we don't like. Boy, that lab, the next thing is kind of awkwardly written. Because you can't force companies. You can't, like, one of the things that companies used to do to keep as much money as they could, instead of paying their workers like regular money, they pay them like chits, which is a little piece of metal, that would be counted as currency only at a store that the company owned. So the company was getting your money coming and going. And basically they made that illegal, uh, that you had to um, force, your uh, force your employees to uh, work at company stores. Child labor was banned. Good old farmer Jim Ferguson promised to limit the amount that sharecroppers could be charged for their fields. In other words, the guy who owned the land could only charge uh, the people that worked his uh, land so much money. Which, of course, the uh, sharecroppers, once again, sharecroppers are white as well as black, all sure poverty knows no color. This made him incredibly popular with the East Texas farmers. Then he had a Dallasite by the name of Thomas B. Love. that really uh, wanted to reform the banking and insurance systems here in Texas. And he was quite successful. Now you have more government oversight in those businesses than ever before. Indeed, I believe by 1920, you had more than 500 uh, chartered state banks. 
basically these weren't banks that were owned by the state. They were banks that had been certified as, these are good guys. This is a sound bank. And by 1917, you have companies cited for violating antitrust laws. But with the good also comes the not so good. There's a movement within the Democratic Party to disenfranchise the black vote. Indeed, progressive Democrats would uh, say that uh, by limiting the white vote, it would cause less violence among whites. The only problem is, legally, it's well nigh impossible to disenfranchise people to vote. So how are they going to do it? Well, they were going to do it by using the poll tax. There's a gentleman, 1915 tax receipt. This is a poll tax from the city of Dallas. Gives age, address, occupation, race. And certain things that would um, be encumbrances for uh, African Americans was it had to be paid for in cash. Basically, these had to be bought in January. You don't have elections until November, so it makes it that much easier to lose. 